Speaking about life and death in the NICU by Annie Janvier. Hello, my name is Annie Janvier, and in this video, I'll be discussing speaking about life and death in the NICU. So how do we learn to communicate about life and death in residency or training or when we're attending staff? We can do medical simulation where there's actors that interact with you. We can read about parental perspectives and how they go through that experience. We can also investigate the contrast between parents and providers by doing the research or reading the articles. And we can learn from others. We can learn through good and bad examples, uh, looking at our colleagues or what happens around us. Other ways to learn about how to communicate is to obtain parents' feedback, those who we took care of their baby. To read stories, books, narratives, blogs, or Facebooks um, about parents and actually our personal experience as provider or patient. How do we learn about these things? When we're a medical resident, um, we're often giving non-practical recommendation. So be empathetic, be compassionate, be warm and human. Often we're being told this without any practical advice of what that means. Also, when we communicate, 70 to 80% of communication is not verbal. It's not necessarily the words we say, but how we say them. And parents rarely write these recommendations about how we should communicate. It's experts who do so. Medical simulation. So how do we deal with death in simulation? Often during simulation, if you do the NRP, if you go through the routines and you know what to do, the mannequin doesn't die. So your mock code doesn't finish with a death. And the question is, should the mannequin die during mock code when you're a trainee? And in opinion-based medicine, so what experts have been writing is that it's not a good idea that the mannequin dies. Why isn't it a good idea? Because trainees that are too emotional won't learn. It's actually hard to retain and remember things when you're emotional. Um, it's also seen to provide an unsafe environment and to harm trainees who are supposed to be in a safe environment when they do mock codes. And a lot of experts also say that we should have a disclosure to say before the mock code, the baby may die. So we've decided to in investigate this with trainees in our hospital, had almost all trainees participate to two mock codes. So they were randomized to start, of the two mock codes, start either with a mannequin that we could resuscitate that was born pulseless, but if we provided adequate resuscitation, the mannequin would have a pulse and live, or to start with a mannequin who would remain pulseless despite adequate resuscitation. This has been published in Pediatrics, and the author is Marie-Hélène Elisot, the first author. So our trainees started with one and then did the other mock code in either order. What we saw is that um, the performance wasn't affected by the simulated death. They did as well when the mannequin lived or died and the performance was good overall. It wasn't either influenced by the order of scenario. So if you started with the death patient, then you may be less organized in the other one. This wasn't the case. And their performance was not um, affected by stress. So their subjective stress, the stress that they report feeling, was more with the simulated death. Interestingly, only one trainee followed the NRP recommendations of stopping resuscitation after 10 minutes of a systole despite adequate resuscitation. A lot of them had to be stopped after 20 minutes and we provided cues for them to stop the resuscitation. After the resuscitation, we asked them, how was this experience for you? And we studied what they said, we transcribed what they said, and we studied it using qualitative methodology. And two themes came up. The first theme is that the mannequin doesn't die. So for example, these are quotes of what the resident said, the mannequin never dies. The baby's not supposed to die. I didn't think mannequins could die during mock codes. The other theme was that when a mannequin dies, this means that the resuscitation was inadequate. 
So the makot where the baby dies is more stressful because it stays dead, which makes us doubt ourselves and our skills, said a second year resident. Or I missed something for the baby who died. In fact, a lot of residents thought they had forgotten something. They should have put in a chest tube, uh, started NO, uh, done an X-ray or something that is not necessarily in the NRP guidelines. When we set them all as a group and asked, like, how was this exercise? And would you do this exercise again? And how, how should we do this better? They all said it was stressful that it was important and necessary to actually have a simulated death, uh, that the feedback session, the individual feedback session was important, that it was important that it was a trainee to trainee exercise because Marie-Hélène Nizad, the author, was a resident at the time we did the research and it wasn't somebody, uh, a senior neonatologist examining them. It also provided them a forum to discuss death together when we actually had feedback as a group. And we asked them, um, is the death disclosure needed? Should we have said that the baby could have died? And there they were unanimous, thinking that no, the death disclosure wasn't necessary. And this is some of what the residents said. Uh, do they think we're babies? It's like when they say on the coffee cup that it's hot. Another one said, perhaps we should have a death disclosures on babies' diapers in the NICU. What we had, though, is trainees saying, well, where are the parents when the baby dies? Because usually when I provide resuscitation and it's not working, and when I'm trying to, have, to do something and it's not working and the baby dies, the parents are there, either because the mother has a cesarean section or because in the NICU the parents are there. So it's actually less stressful than in reality. So why don't you do the same project with parents in the room? And this project was with actual actors in the room, not real parents, but parents playing, actors playing the role of parents. So the goal of this second study was to see what was a good communicator. What do we do when we say in this, these circumstances that are good and what can we do and say that is bad and how can we do things better? So we engaged 31 participants to do a mock code where the mannequin remained pulseless despite adequate resuscitation. We chose the 31 participants to be providers with different backgrounds. So we had transport team doing the uh, RTs, uh, delivery room nurses, neonatologists, residents that were either senior or junior because we wanted different participants who may do things differently to participate. So they did the mock code, they were filmed. The actor, the actor playing the role of parents, the dad and the mom were there. They had a script to follow. The father was getting close um, to the resuscitation, then he was sitting again, then he was angry. There were specific questions that they would ask. And these tapes, these 31 tapes, were each evaluated by 21 evaluators. Again, we chose evaluators from different backgrounds, including six parents whose baby had died in the NICU, including the two actors who played the role of the parents, and some neonatal providers, a neonatologist, a fellow, NICU nurses, and seven non-NICU providers, but who are still healthcare providers, an obstetrician, social work, psychologist, pediatrician. So this gave us 651 evaluations. And in these evaluations, we asked them to rank how was the, the communication from 1 to 10. And we asked them to tell us three positive things that the participant did and three things that the participant could have done better with examples. So we evaluated communication before the resuscitation. They had two, three minutes to prepare for the resuscitation, during the resuscitation, and after the resuscitation. Interestingly, a majority of the time, so almost 80% of the time, providers and parents agreed on who was a good communicator and examples of good communicating in these end-of-life scenarios. Providers spoke mostly about language, words used, but parents, social workers and psychologists spoke more about nonverbal communication, um, body language, how people entered the room, whether they smiled or not. So when people agreed, these are examples that they gave. Good communicators introduced themselves briefly. 
knew or used or asked the name of the baby. Inform the parents that they're preparing for the worst but hoping for the best. This is before the resuscitation. Warns parents that they will only speak to them briefly during the resuscitation, but that they are there for their family. So this, on average, is when people agree how are good communicators before the resuscitation or when things start to go bad. Communication ex examples of good, what is judged to be good communication during resuscitation are the following. The resuscitator lets the parents approach, lets the father approach, acknowledges the parent's presence, uses the name of the baby, prepares the parent for the death, or prepares the parents for the death, and it can be in one, two, or three steps, saying, uh, we're fearing this is not going well, we will continue resuscitation for two, three minutes, we think that Jason may die, um, Jason is probably going to die. They remain calm, they decide to stop resuscitation and don't ask parents their permission to stop resuscitation. And they actually say the words, death, dying, or dead. These are bad examples that were reported by our evaluator. So this is one of the resuscitators telling the dad, stay where you are. We don't have time to speak at the moment. Um, another one asks the family, do you think it's a good time to stop the resuscitation? Another one tells the father, her heart never came back. Or examples such as, this could have been prevented, it's such a shame. After the death, this is what good communicators did. They sat down, they clearly mentioned the death, such as Simon is dead, Simon has died. They tell parents there's nothing they could have done to prevent this. They provide some proximity either then the provider towards the parent, so looking at parents in the eyes, having eye contact, sitting down, being close to the mom and the dad. They also provide some proximity between the baby and the parent. They take the baby to the parent as opposed to leaving the dead baby on the bed. They listen, they tolerate silence. Tolerating silence is waiting for 30 seconds and not interrupting parents or actually sitting in silence. The acknowledged emotions, such as, I can see you're angry, it's normal to be sad in these circumstances. They can answer questions. They're knowledgeable as to what will happen to the body, as what happened, what are the next steps, and they integrate to the family. Sometimes the evaluators disagreed and they didn't mark the resuscitators the same way, and they disagreed on how good they were at communicating. So in one example, the resident asked the father to provide cardiac massage. And the way the resuscitator does that is at the father puts his hand on the baby, and then she took the father's hand and continued cardiac massage, and then went over to the mother's bed and asked dad, do you want to continue cardiac massage, this is the way we do it. Went to the mom, told the mom, your baby's dying, I'm gonna bring your baby to you. Came back and the cardiac massage lasted a couple of seconds, um, less than a minute. Parents thought this was a good communication. They thought this was a good interaction with parents. Providers all thought this was atrocious to do this and it's not with what we are told to do in medicine. Other places where parents and providers disagreed is the use of some jargons or euphemisms that were so used of, to hear that we don't realize they, they don't sound like anything to parents who are not in the medical world. So an example, we would say there's no heart, uh, the baby was born without a heart, uh, the heart didn't come back, the baby expired. And some parents don't understand what it means, an expired baby or a heart that's not coming back. So uh, for as an example, one of the parents said at that point, I didn't know the doctor had really realized the baby was dead. Or why didn't they, they say there was no heart at the ultrasound? Why they thought actually, the parents thought that the baby was born without a heart. So they should have seen that at the ultrasound. Sometimes the attire of some resuscitators um, were judged by parents, generally not by providers. And the proximity, uh, interestingly, for some 
resuscitators who were very, uh, had a lot of proximity, were touching a lot or sitting down on the mother's bed. Some parents thought and providers thought they were very good and other parents and providers thought this was excessive. So it's actually interesting to see that despite looking at the same tapes, some people may disagree in what is proximity or what is adequate or inadequate. Parental versus medical provider views at end of life. So we spoke here about medical simulation. Um, let's speak more about how we learned this and how the medical view can be different from the parent view. So when we speak about life and death, um, the decisions that, for example, parents need to take in the prenatal setting, or decisions that parents need or will take um, in the NICU related to end-of-life decisions, the way the medical system seems to see this is as something that should be standardized. Ideally, what is, is written is that we should communicate to parents all possible adverse outcomes and alternatives. Do this the same way to all the parents, verify that parents have understood, and do this in a neutral and empathetic manner. On the other hand, when we look at the medical literature and we look at what parents want, parents don't want standardization. Parents want personalization. They want the doctors to speak to them, not to a parent. They want the information individualized to their baby, and they want to develop a relationship or some kind of dialogue with the provider. So for example, parents don't want to know only what the percentage risk of cerebral palsy is, or what the risk of mortality is, or the number of babies that go through the NICU with the same risk of deafness or blindness. They want to know what deafness, blindness, cerebral palsy, death means to their family. How are the other families who deal with death? Will she be happy with cerebral palsy? Will we be happy as a family with a kid who's blind? Will we be okay as couples who actually lost a kid? How do the other couples do? Can I be the mom of a dead girl? Or can I be the mom of a disabled girl? And the questions parents ask are questions like, is it better if she dies with or without intensive care? Will I regret it? What will I be able to live with myself? What about my couple? What about me, my career, my other kids? So it's not only about a medical diagnosis or mortality, but what it means to that family. So for example, these, this is a couple who wrote about their experience in the NICU, and they wrote, we did not have 100 babies. We had two, but 50% had died. One was left. What did that mean for Marin? Another example of what parents write is these parents who got together and wrote recommendation on how to speak to families before a delivery. The title of this paper is, Our Child is Not Just a Gestational Age, a first-hand account of what parents want and need to know before premature birth. I strongly recommend this paper. This is an example of the study we did with 300 more parents who lived with their child with who had trisomy 13 and 18. Many of these children are dead. And you can see what doctors see in their training and often what parents are shown in black and white in their prenatal setting about these conditions. And then you can see the big contrast between what parents see when they look at their child. Some of them are very sick and all of these kids are disabled. But these pictures do not look like pictures of what physicians see in textbooks and how we learn to speak about these children. And if you look at family perspectives of what they want to know and what is helpful to them, there's a lot of different families like this. Not only trisomy 13, 18, there's also families of trisomy 21, of families who have a child with Down syndrome who say, I don't want to know all the risks of everything. I want to know what these things mean. What does mental disability mean? What does the risk of leukemia mean? What will it mean to our family? And the same thing for parents of extremely preterm infants at the margin of viability.
So right now, the ongoing research by many groups is to transfer the information and the numbers to parents, either by decision age, a decision coach, um, by information that we give to parents, wanting to speak to the rational parent, wanting for the parent to remember what we tell him or her, and seeing if the parent remembers what we told them. And the thing is that parents also make decisions with their hearts, not only with their brain. And this begs the question of, are emotional decisions bad decisions? And in fact, when emotions are discussed in the informed consent process, we often hear that they're, they negatively influence competence. They're not good. Somebody who's too emotional doesn't think normally. But when we have to decide between a certain death for our child or an uncertain life with uncertain outcomes, it's normal to become highly emotional. In fact, most important decisions we make in life are not rational. So getting married is highly irrational. Having children is probably the most irrational decision a human being will make. Take your resources, pollute the planet. There's no real rational reason to have children. And we evolved when in evolution, and we evolved to make survival decisions with our emotions. So when we cross the street and we're, we hear a honk, we don't have a list of pros and cons. Um, when we avoided the bear or the snake, and we didn't say it's a soft, fuzzy creature, and he looks cute, but he's got big teeth. On the other hand, we don't debate these things. We just get the hell out. So the powerful emotions that influence us may be as morally and scientifically informed as any other algorithm. So in my opinion, their emotions are important and rationality are, are important. So we have to speak to parents' prefrontal cortex, but we also have to speak to their primitive brain because they're also listening and taking decisions with that brain. So what is the solution? The solution is to personalize these conversations with parents as opposed to give a standard uniform consultation or decision aids to family. So how do we do this? It's like a controlled improvisation. Um, it's a good idea to start with, there's nothing you could have done to prevent this. Whether this is premature birth, whether this is enterocolitis and the mom thinks it's her breast milk, or it's a sepsis, but there's nothing parents could have done to prevent this. In the prenatal setting, to ask parents, do you have a name? Some parents will tell you about Lolita, that they had this name in their head for 10 years and they've been trying to have her for 10 years and that she'll play ringette and go to that school and then they will go to Paris when she's five. And others, they won't have a name because if a baby dies, why should we give them a name? Others want to name their first child Robert because all the first children are Robert in their family, but we won't give that name to our kid because he may die. Um, others tell you you're so dumb to ask about a name, what's the point? And any of these answers actually informs you quite a lot about the parents. And tell me about Samuel or Robert or Lolita. Sometimes parents don't have many things to say because they don't know if we should name a child if he dies. And we can inform them that we actually can. It's also important to personalize the information and to personalize decision making. So for example, to say, some good parents that we see want a lot of information about what can happen to premature babies. They want numbers and articles. And other good parents just want the big picture of what happens for babies like mine at 26 weeks. What kind of parent are you? What concerns you the most? Sometimes the concern is not related to the baby. Sometimes fathers are concerned for their wife's health when they are severe eclampsia and they hear everything's critical and the blood pressure is critical. They mind about their baby and they have concerns about their baby. They have more concerns about their partners. Sometimes they're concerned about the three other kids at home because the mom is, sing is a single mother and there's three other kids at home. Sometimes the mom's concerned about her marriage, whether it will last. So sometimes the baby's not necessarily the thing that is most or the person that is most concerning in the whole equation. What can I do for you? Uh, how can I help you? 
And sometimes we can help in ways like opening the window or finding some food for that mother or making sure a babysitter's there and much less than giving statistics about prematurity. Sometimes it's not the neonatologist that can help, but it's important to find who can help that family. A question that is very interesting to ask and that is, has a lot of um, potential is what scares you the most? And it was shown that when you ask that question, and if you're able to speak about what scares people the most, people can actually relax a little bit and, and tackle what's the most important, the most scary, and listen to other things. So sometimes what scares parents the most is disability. Often it's death. Sometimes the mom says death and the dad says disability. Um, sometimes is that you don't want your child to have too much pain. Other times is that it's the last time you'll get pregnant. And that's what scares you the most, to be without a child all your life. And then we can speak to parents. We can speak about what happens to parents who lose children. What happens to parents who have disabled children? What happens when a baby is dead? If they want to hear about that, do you want me to tell you about how other parents go through this? To what you think is the worst thing that can happen? In the NICU, it's also not rare to hear questions like, is my baby dying? Can my baby die? And sometimes parents ask this question when the baby's very stable, um, you know, with a little CPAP and room air at 32 weeks. But it's important to answer that question. Don't say that life is a deadly disease. Don't say that we'll cross the bridge when we come to it. Don't say that everybody can die in the NICU. Actually answer the question. So for a baby who's at 24 weeks, you say, well, babies like Adrian, um, Adrian's doing well. We'd be pleased if he stayed in almost no oxygen, if he didn't need a respirator and only the CPAP, if he continues peeing the way he is, if he stays without an infection and he continues digesting his milk. We'd be concerned if the oxygen went too high, if he stopped peeing, and if he didn't digest his milk. And you can speak to the parents, even if Adrian has uh, enterocolitis, he goes to the operating room. You can say, well, we would be pleased if he starts peeing again, if his blood pressure stays good. If we stand that much amount of oxygen, we'd be concerned if he doesn't stop peeing again, if we still need a lot of medication for his blood pressure. Parents will actually have some idea that where we're going and what the life trajectory of Adrian is. You can ask parents, what can we do for you and Adrian? Sometimes when there's hard decisions to take, some parents don't want to take these decisions. Instead of asking them, please take these decisions for your children, or we will help you take these decisions, or parents take these decisions and we don't, you can ask them. Some parents want us to inform them so they can decide for Adrian. Others want to decide with us what's better for Adrian. Others want to decide with somebody else what to decide for Adrian. And some parents think that they shouldn't decide these things and they want us to give them a recommendation. What kind of parents are they? Some parents don't want the burden of that decision. And some parents in our studies have said, well, it helped when the doctor said, well, if you were Adrian, what would you want if you were him? Instead of saying, what would you want as Adrian's mother? What do you think if you were in Adrian's body, going through what he went through, what would you decide? Also, we have to keep in mind that many parents in these circumstances do not speak about a decision and they don't think that the doctor has control. They think that God decides, or nature decides, or the baby decides, or fatality decides. They don't think that we have control. And some parents have said it's helpful in that situation for the doctor not to tell us he has control, because then it's impossible to decide for the death of our child. So to say, well, if we had the control, doctors, Adrian wouldn't be born at 24 weeks. Adrian wouldn't have had enterocolitis and he wouldn't have his lungs get destroyed week after week. If we had decided, he'd be home with you. So we also feel powerless in what to do. And what do you think and what scares you the most? 
And if you were Adrian, where, would, where do you think this is going? Some families ask you, what would you do in my situation? And don't avoid this question. Don't say, well, I can't tell you what to do. You should decide. These parents have decided they want your input. It's not necessarily your personal input. So I'm the mom of a premature baby, and often I didn't agree with my husband. So I tell them, well, I can tell you what Annie Janvier would do, but then I will get my husband, and who's also a neonatologist and that you've met before, and he won't necessarily say the same thing as me. But I can tell you what other parents do and how other parents decide these things. So for example, other parents who are the parents of babies like Adrian, they say, you know, after four months in the NICU, I want to give my child one last chance. I wouldn't be able to live with myself not having the respirator again or not trying one last time. But I know he's tired. And other parents say, well, you know what, Adrian has gone through so much that I don't want to do this again. I think, you know, we're not winning here and we just impose things to him over and over. And what kind of parent are you? Because parents decide different things and there's no good decision. And we can give you a recommendation if you want. We can meet as neonatologists and tell you and inform you or tell you what we think is the best thing for Adrian. So what are other ways we can learn about parental perspectives? There's a lot of great blogs out there. There's great Facebook pages, Facebook groups. And I would advise just to go on a group or to join a parent group to see what parents speak about. They often don't speak about percentage of cerebral palsy. They speak about how hard it is to feed their kid, um, how the stomach gets blocked all the time, um, how it's tough to come back to the emergency room, how it's so hard not to sleep when your kid's sick. None of these outcomes that we measure in the medical literature. So these are examples of great blogs that I read or great sites like the March of Dime sites of the Miracle Baby Foundation from Australia where some parents, um, where there's an interface for parents. You can also read stories that are published in the medical literature. I've written some of these like Pepperoni Pizza and Sex or No Time for Death. There's great stories like A Piece of My Mind, Misgivings, Why Were They in Such a Hurry to See Her Die? And there's a lot of amazing narratives in the medical literature. There's also great books about prematurity. A Girl in Glass. If you speak French, there's Be Respire, Bebe Respire. It's my book that maybe will come one day in English. Juniper, The Girl Who Was Born Too Soon is an amazing book. This Lovely Life also. And I think the most important point here is to stay in touch and to have some feedback from parents. The way I do this is I track or I look at who are complex fat babies that I had in my practice or patients who died. And I actually write a card to all the parents, all these parents that had prevented me to sleep or that I thought about at home or that will stay with me uh, forever. And I sent them a card with my contact information. I put my email, but you could put your address. And I write to them what the impact their baby had on my life, that it was a privilege to have been part of their lives. And a moment I remember in the baby's life, a little detail that changed my outlook of things. Also a moment I felt I could have been better when I took care of their child or of them. And I tell them they're lucky and the baby was lucky. The baby is lucky to meet them and to, to have parents like them. And I actually ask um, parents for feedback. And just a quick example, um, one mom I asked about feedback a year later wrote me, um, you know, the day where I hated you the most was the day you told us, oh, your baby will have a PDA ligation. It's just a small heart surgery. It's just a routine thing. The baby will be back and she'll be fine in no time. And the mom thought I was the most ruthless, nasty person. She showed me the email with a lot of swear words she wrote to her husband at that point. Um, how dare she say this and such an insensitive freak and, you know, all these things. And I asked her, geez, you know, I'm, I've been saying this for eight years. What should I have said? And she said, well, you can say 
For the cardiac surgeon, this is routine surgery. It's done in an hour between big cases. But for parents, this is one of the worst things. They'll have to face a heart surgery in a tiny baby. You'll, you'll be scared, but we'll be there with you. And your baby will come back and it'll be harder for the first few days, but then, you know, it'll get better. So this is, this will be hard, but it's something we do all the time. And since then, I've been saying this, but had I not asked, I would have continued for the rest of my career to say this was routine cardiac surgery. And the last thing is not to outsource death. Not to, I call it the mech death trio, to have clinical ethics, palliative care, and spiritual advisors take care of all that job. They're very useful. Social workers are useful. Psychologists are useful. But this is our job. We have to listen to parents. We have to deal with this. We can't disappear when a baby starts to die. We, can't, we have to face the music when the music is happening. This is part of our jobs. There's a lot of jobs in medicine where you don't have to deal with these conversations. But if you chose neonatology, you have to deal with them. And you have to speak about uncomfortable things. And the best way to stop speaking about them is to give all that job to others and to do it less and less and to feel less and less comfortable until one day it's not your job anymore. So the take home message is that there's many easy practical ways to improve our interaction with parents. And words like humanity and, and feeling and being nice and being empathetic um, often is not enough. There's easy ways that even if you're post-call, you haven't slept, if you know you have to sit down, use the name of the baby, look at the parents in the eyes, sometimes shut up a little bit, families will all feel that they're well cared for. Practical communication can be taught, and it's not that complicated, and trainees can build from there. It's important to listen to parents, to stay in touch, to investigate parental experiences, and to remember that you're important to them. Thank you for listening to this video. Please help us improve the content by providing us with some feedback.